So as we get into today's Easter message, um, uh, it might be a little bit different, but you know what? It is a, it is a celebration nevertheless. And so I want to share with you something very, very simple. Uh, the, I just entitled this Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, I want you to uh, go, if you have your Bibles with you, or you can open the app, go with me to John chapter 19. The verses should uh, be on uh, the bottom of your screen. And uh, listen to what John writes, and he says this. Jesus knew that he had now finished his work. This is John 19, 28. And in order to make the scriptures come true, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of cheap wine was there. Someone then soaked a sponge with wine and held it up to Jesus' mouth on the stem of a hyssop plant. After Jesus drank the wine, he said, everything is done. It is finished. He bowed his head and died. Now imagine we were there. Uh, imagine we were there with the disciples, and we were the ones that he called. We, we laughed together. We, we, we cried together. We prayed together. We experienced life together. We, we saw the miracles. We were, we were there when Jesus entered Jerusalem just the, the, the Sunday before. We heard the crowd saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Life was good. No, life was great. But then Friday happened. How many of you know Fridays happen to all of us? Friday is painful because on Friday, in the eyes of the disciples, hope died. And Friday was a tragedy. It was the day when, when all they thought about God's kingdom uh, was coming to an end. All the miracles they witnessed with their own eyes, all the outpouring of love that they saw from Jesus is suddenly and abruptly, it's over. It is finished did not mean the same thing for them as it, as it means for us today. For them, it is finished meant they were finished. Jesus was finished. Now, we come with the knowledge today that Friday is not final, but they did not have the knowledge of Friday that we have today. On Friday, Jesus was crucified. On Friday, Jesus died. On Friday, hope ended. On Friday, pain was magnified. On Friday, death has won. On Friday, hearts are crushed. On Friday, questions are many. Fridays are hard. Friday is difficult. Friday is agonizing. Friday is painful. On Friday, the dream is over. On Friday, the dream is dead. How does Friday end? Listen to uh, what Matthew writes in Matthew 27. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. Fridays are difficult because we feel helpless. And the only action we can take is to bury that which we placed our hope in. Friday started at the cross and finished in a tomb. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you are there today. Uh, maybe you are there right now. On Fridays, it feels like you, you are living a dream. As a matter of fact, it's not even a dream. It's a nightmare. In fact, you see your life kind of play out before you. And, and just like the Marys, you feel like it's like watching a train wreck. The only thing you can do is watch you feel helpless. Fridays are hard. Fridays are filled with disappointment. Fridays are filled with pain. The difficulty of Friday is we don't know about Sunday. So what do you do when it's Friday in your life? Just like the Marys did in verse 61, you have no control, you can only watch. You watch on Friday. Now, the other end of Friday, Saturday, is another day. And if Friday is painful, uh, what can we say about Saturday? Uh, the only word that comes to my mind when it comes to the Saturday, specifically the Saturday that we are talking about before the Sunday, is silence. The word called silence. So Friday is difficult, Friday is painful, but what about Saturday? Saturday is silent. It's as silent, excuse the expression, as the grave. The silence of Saturday, look in Matthew 27, 62. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about what happened on the Saturday. It has a lot to say about the week before. It has a lot to say about the Friday, but very little to say about the Saturday. As a matter of fact, this is what it has to say about Saturday. On Matthew 27, 62, the next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. 
So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he's been raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it as best as you can. Now, as far as we know, there's only been one day in the last 2,000 plus years that literally not one person believed that Jesus was alive. It is Saturday. The day after the crucifixion on Friday, crowds were screaming on Friday, crucify him. The city was filled with screams for blood, but it is Saturday and suddenly all is quiet. For most of us, especially believers, the, the day before Saturday, which means Friday, and the day after Sunday, which is Sunday, are the most discussed days of all. Scholars study it, skeptics scoff at it, worshipers are drawn to it, we celebrate it, we cry about Friday, we shout about Sunday, but very few ever talk about Saturday. It is Saturday, the day after Friday and the day before Sunday. The Bible says a lot about it, uh, a, lot about, a lot about the Friday, and it says a lot about the Sunday, but almost strangely, the Bible is very quiet on Saturday. The verses we just read that I just read to you is about all that we know about this particular Saturday. The Saturday that, fell, that, that, that falls between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. W what are we to make of this? Uh, the silence of Saturday. The, the Saturday has no name. Have you noticed? It has no name. We have a name for Friday. We call it Good Friday. We have a name uh, for Sunday. We call it Resurrection Sunday or we call it Easter Sunday. But what is Saturday? Saturday is just that. Saturday. I think there's a song that goes Saturday, Saturday. Well, this is just Saturday. Saturday is the day that we pray with no answers. Saturday is the day after we've experienced incredible pain uh, uh, that there's no guarantee that we will ever recover from it. Saturday is a peculiar day. It is a day in between, in between sorrow and joy, between despair and hope, between desperation and deliverance. The problem with Saturday is that we see nothing change from Friday. Saturday feels like Friday will never end. The challenge of Saturday is that nothing happened. That's as far as we know. Imagine the disciples, and, and, and if, you could, if you could this Easter morning just kind of work with me. Uh, imagine in your imagination the, the disciples coming to, to grips with Saturday. There's now only a few of them left because most have cut and run. Uh, what, of, what kind of conversation do you think, if any, did they have on Saturday? Maybe, you know, what went wrong? Uh, you know, they're trying to make sense of all of this. And in their minds, as difficult as, uh, as the thought might be, here's what they're thinking. Jesus failed. Jesus, the one in, in, in whom they thought that they could trust. Jesus, the one that they thought was the Messiah, the one to come, the, the one that was supposedly to come and usher in the kingdom of God, is dead. He's lying in a tomb. They know where he's buried. They've seen it for themselves. It is Saturday, and God is silent. Everybody knows Saturday. It is the day that your dream is dead, but you are still alive, and you still have to wake up, and you still have to deal with the reality. You still have to go on. But you, but you don't know how. Silence happens on, on, on Saturday. You pray. You cry. You weep. You, you say, do something, God. Deliver me, God. Hear me, God. Rescue me, God. But nothing but silence. The husband that prays for a wife, nothing but silence. The parents praying for a child to return, but nothing but silence. The, the mom and dad praying for a little child to be healed, but nothing but silence. The mom longing for the prodigal to return, but nothing but silence. You have a dream, on, uh, uh, you have a dream for someone, but on Friday it dies. But on Saturday, all you feel is that there is this perpetual pain, this perpetual silence. You could abandon hope and you could say, well, you know, Saturday is never going to uh, come to an end and, 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 and there is no Sunday and, and I'm just going to live in this Fridays of life, in this pain of life, the same pain, the same regret, the, the same disappointment. And this is just going to how I'm going to have to live my life over and over again, nothing to look forward to. What make matters worse is that, yes, the problem with us, we don't know Why? Why? Why is there a Saturday? I mean, why are Saturdays even necessary? If God was going to raise up Jesus anyway, I mean, come on, God, just get on with it. I mean, let's, let's, move, this, let's move this thing forward. I mean, let's get this party started. 
Why wait? Paul writes for us in 1 Corinthians, and he gives us a little bit of insight that we need, and he says this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins Friday. Just as the scripture said, he was buried Saturday. And he was raised from the dead Sunday on the third day, just as the scripture said. Paul tells us that it is according to scripture. Now, now here's what you got to know. Uh, maybe you're not a scripture person this morning tuning in, but, but just, just hear me out. You would I have to say, the Old Testament is filled with three-day stories. Abraham has to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, and he sees the sacrifice that will save Isaac from, uh, uh, from a sure death. When does he see the sacrifice? On the third day. Joseph's brothers land up in prison, and they get released. Guess when? On the third day. Rahab are told by the spies that she and her family needs to hide but will be saved on the third day. Esther hears about what will happen to all the Jews and how Haman wants to annihilate them. And she prays and the king receives her. Guess what day? You write on the third day. Listen to how the prophet Hosea puts it. I love this. Hosea 6 verse, verse, uh, verse 1, he says this, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us, let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established in the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain in the earth. Three-day stories. The first day, trouble. The third day, deliverance. The second day, silence. The problem with three-day stories is this, is that you don't know it's a three-day story until the third day. When it is Friday and when it is Saturday, as far as you can see, as far as I can see, Sunday is never coming. It's may maybe you feel like that right now. Maybe you, in a situation like that right now that you feel, man, listen, I've been living this perpetual pain. I've been living this Saturday all of my life. And, and, I, and I, I don't think Sunday is ever going to come. I, I understand that. I'm a Cowboys fan. I know, I know. Wise men follow a star. But the Cowboys haven't won anything for over 25 years. If you're a Cowboys fan, it's always Friday. And the secret to survive as a Cowboys fan is the same as when you parent teenagers. Lower your expectations. It's the only way to get through it. But in all seriousness, there remains only one question about Saturday. And what is it? What do you do on Saturday? You want to hear it? You wait. You wait. Look at Luke 23. Watch what it says. As his body was taken away, the woman from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as required by the law. They rested. They waited. Mark 15 says this. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now listen to what Mark says about him. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. I find it very significant that it was a waiting man that put Jesus in the tomb. What do you do on Saturday? You wait. When the answer seems to be delayed, you wait. When heaven seems to be silent, you hate. When hope is, is waning, you wait. When silence is deafening, you wait. Now, you don't wait hopelessly. You don't wait hope with hopelessness. You wait with expectation. You prepare. You say, what do you prepare for? You prepare for Sunday. You put your shoes in front of that tomb because Sunday is, com is coming and your dream is coming to life again. There's an ancient homily that spoke of this strange day. What happened today on earth? There is a great silence, a great silence in stillness, a great silence because the king sleeps. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep. Jesus descended into hell. Somehow, 
No suffering you go through is suffering that Jesus will not endure in order to save you. Listen to what I just said. From our own human standpoint, we think the miraculous day is Sunday. And and it's probably true. The day when Jesus is raised from the dead, just maybe, just maybe from heaven's point of view, the miracle is not uh, on Sunday, but it's on Saturday when all of heaven is a witness to God in the tomb. Jesus defeats our final enemy. And how does he do it? This enemy called death. How does he do it? He does it by, not by proclaiming his invincibility over it, but by submitting himself to it. Oh my goodness. Think about it. If you can find Jesus in a grave, if you can find Jesus in death, if you can find Jesus in hell, where can you go where Jesus will not turn up? No matter how painful your Friday, how silent your Saturday, Jesus is there. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? When it is Saturday, you wait. Why? Because Sunday is coming. Oh, man, I need you to shout. Sunday is coming. Now, what about Sunday? Honestly, Sunday needs no explanation. Sunday is the day we shout. Because there's joy in the Sundays of life. Look at Matthew 28. Watch. This happened. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened because the angel just appeared to them. But also, listen to these words, filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, I love this, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Now this is very important. If you tune in today uh, or you're online because maybe somebody invited you to to log on or or promise you a steak dinner after COVID is over, I don't know, you know, or maybe you're just stuck with family, you got nowhere to go and you're kind of stuck and they're making you watch this because it's Easter and, you know, mom says watch and you're going to watch and, and, uh, you know, you're not into this Jesus thing or, you know, or, you know, or, or, or any of that. Listen to what I have to say to you. We do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells us so. We believe because of first-hand account witnesses that wrote it down for us. John, Peter, Thomas, Matthew, Mark, Mary, Martha, Paul. We believe because Luke came along later and thoroughly investigated these events and talked to as many eyewitnesses as possible and put together an account. We believe because John, who was an eyewitness, put together an account of Jesus' life. We believe because Peter believed Jesus rose from the dead and later wrote letters to the church to say it's much. We believe because James, the brother of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, who shows up late in this story, declares, imagine this for those of you who have brothers. Maybe you're sitting next to your brother right now. Imagine declaring this about your brother. He is my Lord. These these eyewitness accounts were written down. They were copied. They were collected. They were distributed. And they were put together. That's why we say that the foundation of the Christian faith is an event. An extraordinary event with profound implications for all of our lives. All of our hopes. All of our dreams. All of our joys. All of our sorrows. All of our Fridays. All of our Saturdays can end because of one Sunday. Peter, who started following Jesus early on, he left the fishing business. And Peter, the one who Jesus tried to tell him uh, he had to suffer and die. And and then he tried to rebuke Jesus because of it. Peter, who, who after Jesus told the rich young ruler to go and sell all that he has and to follow him, ask about, okay, well, what about us? We've left everything. Peter, who in the most crucial moments lost his faith and then denied he knew Jesus to a young girl, then followed from a distance, then this, then he once believed, then he unbelieved, then he, no, then he stopped believing, and then after the resurrection, he re-believed. This Peter that was later beheaded uh, under Nero's uh, Rome sits down towards the end of his life and he retells the story with Mark writing it down. And at some point he writes two letters, mostly likely through a scribe, and they are part of our New Testament. And he writes this, 
And he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you hear that? to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter was convinced about this relational factor with God as Father. He also says that we have a a living hope, not a dead one, a living hope. Why? Through their resurrection. He says, hey man, I saw this for myself. He talks about this inheritance. Who gets an inheritance? Children gets an inheritance. But, 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 but where is this inheritance? It's kept in heaven. Now, don't skip over that. Peter did not believe in heaven because of what he was told as a child or that because someone, you know, wanted him to feel better because he could not cope. You know, religious people can't cope with death, so therefore they made up heaven. And so, you know, there's this made up story. Yeah, uh, but you have to understand that the Jewish scripture says very little about heaven. As a matter of fact, it says so little about, uh, about the afterlife to the extent that, that half of the Jewish leaders did not believe there was a heaven. They, were, they are Sadducees. they sad, you see, because they don't believe there's a heaven. They believe that once you died, that was it. And you lived for the pleasure of God and life ended when life ended. Yet Peter believed in heaven. Not because of what he was taught as a child, but because a resurrected Jesus talked often about heaven and because Sunday happened. Look at 1 Peter 1. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Listen very carefully. This is incredible. Peter did not for one moment doubt the love of God because of suffering. He did not doubt the Father's love or the the Father's existence because of the pain in life. He did not doubt God's love because of Fridays, because of the Saturdays of life. His faith was secured even if suffering was a guarantee for his own future. He saw Jesus suffer and then he saw Jesus alive. He had breakfast with Jesus when he wanted to give up. If you're watching today, and you've lost your faith because of pain of this life, or maybe because of pain in your own life, because of some kind of Friday that seems never to end, or maybe, or or just maybe because of what you've experienced, I want to kindly ask you to reconsider the folks who are eyewitnesses to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. They themselves went through incredible suffering, suffering you and I cannot even imagine. Yet they did not lose their faith because they saw the best person, the kindest person, the most loving person, the most dedicated person, the person who only did good, the person who healed the sick, fed the hungry, calmed the storms, gave uh, uh, mothers back their dead children. The best person went through the worst suffering and abuse and lies and betrayal, but they believed anyway. You see, their faith was not an imaginary God, but the real one who conquered death before their very eyes. And even at the cost of their own suffering in their own lives, they could not deny themselves what they saw for themselves. Why? They experienced Sunday. There was nothing in it for them making it up. Their reward for following and proclaiming Jesus was what? Beheading, spears, upside down crucifixions, being torn apart for sport, being burned at the stakes as human torches, being thrown into stadiums and torn apart by wild animals, seeing their own children beaten to death. That was their reward on this side of eternity. Now, how does a guy who cannot even keep it together in front of a teenage girl about who he follows, change to be crucified upside down. Three years of Jesus' teaching. Three years of all this wonderful teaching that Jesus taught them. Uh, The Beatitudes. I mean, just imagine all that Jesus taught. Three years of good works. Three years of miracles could not persuade him until Jesus walked into a locked room and said, Shalom, peace. What's up? What's happening? Guten Abend. Hola. Buenas noches. Bonjour. Hello. Dobre witchor. Magadangabe. Male vanakam. Saubona. Guten Abend. Huyanand. Bonasera. Come va? Hello, somebody. I love it. The Sunday evening while the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them and said hello. 
I want you to know, no matter where you're at today, no matter when you're the difficulty of your Friday, whether you are in the silence of your Saturday, there is a Sunday that awaits you. And the Sunday that we put our faith in, the Sunday that we are counting on, is that Sunday that Jesus walked out of that tomb. Today, you can come out of that place of difficulty by understanding not just to be set free from the pain that you're suffering, but to, be un to understand that God in the midst of your pain is there because Jesus faced everything you faced. And you can hold on to your faith and you can trust Him in the midst of everything that is going on in the world right now. But you have to download this truth that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him. You have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. What are we going to do with this Jesus? We can't just say that He just was a good man. Jesus Christ is either who He says He is, or He's a liar and a lunatic. You cannot be kind of semi-convinced. Kind of being semi-convinced is saying that you are semi-pregnant. You have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. The Bible tells us very clearly that God has said before us life and death, blessing and a curse. That the choice is ours. That we choose who we are going to serve. That we make a decision. And on this Easter Sunday, on this Sunday that, that changed the world forever. On this Sunday when, when the scribes and the Pharisees thought that they shut Jesus up permanently. What they didn't realize, hope walk out of a tomb and hope is walking into your room right now. Hope is walking into your living room right now. Sunday is coming into your life right now. Allow Jesus to say peace unto you and embrace the Prince of Peace. Do you want the truth or do you want somebody to just placate it? I don't know about you. I need the truth. You know, when it comes to certain things in our lives, we demand the truth. You know, uh, when you go to the mechanic shop and, 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 and you have them check your car, maybe, maybe your, brakes, your brakes need work and, and they're working on your car. And afterwards, the mechanic might tell you, say, hey, listen, man, your brakes are fine. And say, well, what if you get into that car and you drive down the street, you drive down Winchester and you, and you try to apply the brakes and there's no brakes. And just by, by, by the grace of God, you, you don't get in an accident. You're able to stop. And aren't you going to go back to that mechanic shop and say, hey, man, I thought you, I thought you said my car was okay. You, 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 you told me my brakes are working. And, 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 and what if the mechanic said to you, well, you know what, I really just didn't want to offend you. You know, your, 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 your brakes were shot, but I know that, you know, people don't, like, people don't like to hear that they have to pay money to fix what needs to be fixed. So, you know, I just thought that this can be a nice, safe place that, you know, nobody has to get mad. Nobody has to get offended. You know, I thought that you would be okay. I tell you what, you'll be, you won't be okay. You'll be mad. You'll say, hey, when it comes to, when it comes to my safety, I want the truth. I want you to tell me the truth. What about if you go to the doctor's office and, 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 and the doctor looks at you and, and gives you a clean bill of health and say, oh, you're fine. Don't worry about it. What about a, a week later, you walk up the stairs and, and, and you have a massive heart attack and you almost die. And that same doctor walks in and you say, doctor, wait a minute. I, I, I went a week ago and, 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 you know, I asked you if I was in good shape and, and you said, you know, I was fine. I mean, what gives? What's going on? Why don't you tell me the truth? And the doctor says, man, listen, when I tell people that they have to change, and, and when I tell people that, you know, they have to change their lifestyle, I, I knew when I saw you, you were one, you know, peanut bitter cup, uh, peanut bitter cup away from, from, from seeing Jesus. You know, I, I know you look like the Pillsbury Doughboy, but I, I didn't want you to be offended. You know, I, I don't, I, I, want, I want my practice to be a safe practice where people just feel loved and appreciated. How many of you know you'll be mad? You'll say, listen, when it comes to my life, when it comes to my health, you better tell me the truth. What's amazing to me is we want the truth in all aspects of life except when it comes to our spiritual lives. We want to say that all roads lead to God. We want to say that all thoughts and all truth is equally valid. But I've got news for you, it's not. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who walked out of that tomb on that Sunday morning. And so... This moment, right now, I'm going to ask you, if you would just, just wait for one more moment. I'd love to pray with you this Easter Sunday. For those of you that are tuning in for the first time and somebody asks you, I'm so glad. Thank you for doing that today. Would you let me pray with you right now? Would you do that? 
Come, let's, let's pray together so that this Jesus can walk and say peace to you right now. Father, I just bring every person to you. I thank you that as I pray right now, wherever they may be in their homes and in different places, I ask that you would bring your peace to them now in Jesus' name. Lord, I know that there are people out there that are, that are still on the Fridays of life. There are people there that are still on the Saturdays of life where all they hear is nothing but silence. And I pray right now that you would come and minister grace to them. If you are listening now, I want you to just pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. And I acknowledge that you died for me. But I also acknowledge that you were raised from the dead for me. Lord, I thank you for Friday that you died. But I celebrate Sunday that you are alive. And I pray now, come and live big in me. I thank you that my past is forgiven and forgotten, washed away by the precious blood of Jesus. And just like Peter said, I look forward to my inheritance that is laid up for me. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen and amen. What do you do on Sunday? On Sunday, you worship just like the women did. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer with us for the very first time, all you need to do is text DECIDED to 94000, DECIDED to 94000. And we'd love to reach out to you. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to talk to you about the journey and the steps that you are taking in order to follow Jesus. This is what this is all about. Happy Easter, everybody. Just remember, if you are in Friday right now, and if you are in a Saturday right now, Sunday is coming. God bless you.